everyone. I'm Emma Whipday and this is Stay at Home Shakespeare with a bit lit. Today we're going to be looking at King Lear, a play about people who are shut out of the home and exposed to the elements without shelter. So today, Stay at Home Shakespeare is going outside. Stay at home Shakespeare! Of course, this video won't actually be filmed outside. I'm still in lockdown, so I filmed the intro to today's video when I was on my daily walk. But I wanted to begin outside, because I wanted to start this video by thinking about the importance to the idea of the home, of the possibility of its opposite, of being stranded outside the home, of being shelterless. Those of you who've been watching Stay at Home Shakespeare will know that this series is both the opportunity for me to talk to you about ideas about Shakespeare from my home, perhaps to you and yours. But also it's an exploration of what the home means in Shakespeare and in early modern England more broadly. I've talked about the association between the home and the female body, the association between the home and chastity, and the significance of the home as a place for keeping possessions and for keeping privacy inside it. And in my video for last week, looking at Othello, I explored the perils of that privacy, especially when murder's involved. However, in week one, I also explored the importance of the home as a literal threshold to the outside world, as a building that could let in good things like light and air, but that would keep out dangerous influences, whether that's foul air and contagion, witchcraft and magic, or the weather. And it's that final idea of the home as a shelter that keeps out the weather that's important in King Lear, and that's what I'm going to be exploring today. But I want to start not by talking about the play, but by talking about a ballad. Ballads were popular songs that were sold very cheaply in the Elizabethan and Jacobean periods. You could buy one for a penny, which was the price of your daily loaf of bread, or some watered down ale that you might have for breakfast, or standing room at the theatre. So it was open to all but the very poorest as a form of entertainment. It was also open to the illiterate. A large proportion of the population were illiterate in this period because you could buy the ballad and read it and sing it, but you could also hear the ballad singer on the street singing it or hear someone who'd purchased it singing it in the tavern or in your own home. And this particular ballad is of interest, not because I think it's influenced Shakespeare, because it, we don't have a date, it doesn't have a date on it, but it may have been written afterwards. A lot of people have suggested it's written at around 1620, which is nearly 15 years after Lear. But rather, I want to talk about it because I think it has similar concerns and obsessions to Lear and suggests the kind of anxieties about homelessness that are circulating in early modern England something I'm going to come back to at the end. This ballad is called A Most Excellent Ballad of an Old Man and His Wife. And unlike last week with the Othello song, I'm not going to sing this one because while we know the name of the tune, the tune itself doesn't survive. But the ballad opens with the lines, It was an old man which with his poor wife in great distress did fall. They were so feeble with age, God wot, or God knows, they could not work at all. A gallant son they had, which livered wealthily. To him they went with full intent to ease their misery. And then the chorus continues, alack and alas for woe, probably repeated a couple of times, which suggests that the song is not going to end well for the old man and woman. It continues, a hundred miles when they had got, with many a weary step, at length they saw their son's fair house, which made their hearts to leap. They sat them on the green, their shoes and hose or tights to trim, to put clean bands around their necks, against they should enter in, alack and alas for woe, etc. So here, as they visit their son's house, they're careful to address, adjust their dress to ensure that they're dressed respectably enough to be allowed to enter and not to make their son ashamed of them. The ballad continues, Unto the door with trembling joints, when those old couple came, the woman with a shaking head, the old man blind and lame. Full mannerly they knocked, fearing for to offend. At last their son doth frowningly come. 
unto them in the end, alack and alas for woe, etc. So here the old couple have a very clear sense of household boundaries. They're aware that they are outside the home and that they don't have the right, even though you might think they could have that right as, as the parents of the son, to just walk in. They have to knock, they have to wait, they have to be respectably presented and dressed. And the line, at last their son does frowningly come, suggests that their son even keeps them waiting before coming to answer the door. Then, later in the ballad, he refuses to allow them in at all, refuses to even allow them to sleep in his barn like vagabonds, and instead sends them on their way to penury and eventually to death. However, the son gets his comeuppance. His own children see how he treats his parents, and having such an example before them, decide to kill him for his money and property. They do so successfully, they inherit, and then their cousin, seeing how they treat their parent, decides to kill them for the inheritance. So this inhospitable reception and this lack of filial obedience and gratitude, the fact that the son does not show his parents the respect and love that they deserve, essentially begins this cycle of violence and horror so that the home becomes a slaughterhouse because he refuses to allow them to come inside. And in this period, where a parent is believed to be the head of a household and to rule over his or her children, you can see just how significant it is that here the son refuses to obey his parents or even to show them common hospitality. I wanted to begin with this ballad because it sets up the power relations between parents who are without shelter and a child who has it, and an anxiety about the fact that the child might not extend this shelter to their parents. But King Lear actually starts in a slightly different place. As you may know, it begins with King Lear deciding to divide his kingdom between his three daughters, in essence to give away his kingdom, as if it's an inheritance, before he dies, and then to become dependent upon those three daughters for shelter, as he'll have no home of his own. In doing this, he relies on what his daughters say about him and how much they love him in order to decide how to divide the kingdom. And so Goneril and Regan, his two daughters who are very willing to flatter, both flatter him extensively and say how much they love him, how they love him more than their husbands, and so he's very willing to give them all. However, his third daughter, Cordelia, loves him truly and is honest and won't be over the top in her declarations of affection. And so he not only refuses to give her this portion of her inheritance, but he disinherits her completely in refusing her to allow to stay within the court and sending her out into the world without a home. And Kent, his good adviser, when he learns this, says to Cordelia, the gods to their dear shelter take thee, maid. This is one of the first mentions of the word shelter in the play, and it's a really significant one because it suggests just how important this is going to be in the play to come. The idea here is that Cordelia has no human shelter. The only people who can shelter her are the gods, which is a vulnerable and tragic position to be in. Although shortly after this, she receives a marriage proposal, which ensures her safety. And paradoxically, it's her father who ends up seeking shelter throughout the rest of the play. And the fool, who is a comic character that later turns tragic, and becomes a truth-teller throughout the play, comments on this sort of obliquely, so in a sideways way, when he says to Lear, I can tell why a snail has a house. Lear says why, and the fool answers, why to put his head in, not to give it away to his daughters, and leave his horns without a case. Those of you who watched the Othello video may remember that I talked about the image of the tortoise as being like an ideal woman in the period, because the tortoise carries his home on his back and can disappear inside it at any time. Here we have a similar image with the snail. The snail carries its home, its house, upon its back and can similarly disappear inside it. But of course, because Lear is doing things at the wrong times in the wrong way, he's giving away his inheritance before he's dead and giving up his government, his kingship, over the kingdom in order to grant it to his daughters. He's doing things in a topsy-turvy way that leaves him like a snail without a shell, as the fool comments. But this isn't the only disruptive home in the play. There are also instances where people's homes are taken away from them forcibly, 
not because they no longer have a shelter, but because they no longer have control over their homes. This happens in the case of Gloucester, who remains loyal to the king and who is visited by the king's daughter Regan and her husband Cornwall. As Gloucester complains, they took from me the use of mine own house. They basically take over his home and take over the government of it in a form of home invasion, which eventually comes to a gruesome and grisly conclusion as they remove his eyes in his own home. Gloucester later complains, I am your host, with robber's hands, my hospitable favours, you should not ruffle thus. Now this is a startling abuse of hospitality to use it to turn extreme violence upon your host. There are anxieties about inhospitable behaviour elsewhere in Shakespeare. For example, in Macbeth, when Macbeth decides to kill Duncan while he's staying in his house, while he's sleeping in his house, he worries about the fact that as his host, he should, in his words, against the murderer shut the door, not bear the knife myself. So a host is meant to guard guests, not to kill them while they're in his home. You'll recognise a similar anxiety about hospitality and the horrors of inhospitality in the ballad I began this video with, the idea that children would not allow their parents into their home. But here we have a different abuse of hospitality, where the host is being abused by the guests, and they further abuse Gloucester as host by refusing to allow him to open his home to other guests, namely they won't allow the king inside even though a storm rages, and so they leave him open to the elements and vulnerable to them. Cornwall says, let us withdraw, twill be a storm, and then, shut up your doors, my lord, tis a wild night, my Reagan counsels well, come out of the storm. And there are many references to wild nights and to storms in this scene, and it becomes really chilling as the scene progresses to think of all these references to the violent elements, to the winds and rain and storm, and the insistence that these characters are going to go through the stage door behind the stage, are going to be inside and safe and protected, but other characters, like us the audience, are left outside in the storm with no protection. And Lear is not the only character who ends up vulnerable to the storm. In the second plot of Lear, Edgar is having to flee his father because his father has been convinced by his other son, Edmund, who's illegitimate, that Edgar is trying to kill him. And so Edgar goes on the run and decides to disguise himself in the shape of what he calls a bedlam beggar, so a madman who begs. And this is an interesting shape to choose, both because it was a despised shape, and I'll say a bit more about that in a second, but also because it was a shape associated with fakery, with fraudulence. People often suspected that bedlam beggars were pretending to be mad in order to beg. And of course, Tom is indeed pretending to be mad, but not in order to beg, rather in order to seem insignificant. But seeming insignificant exposes him to the elements in just the same way that Lear is exposed. When he makes this decision, he says, I will preserve myself and am bethought to take the basest and most poorest shape, so the sort of lowest and poorest shape, that ever penury and contempt of man brought near to beast. So he's suggesting that in this disguise, he loses some of his humanity. He becomes almost animal-like. He continues, my face are grime with filth, blanket my loins, elf all my hair in knots, and with presented nakedness outface the winds and persecution of the sky. I think that's an amazing phrase for the storms they face, the persecution of the sky. They're being attacked by the sky. And here he's saying that he's going to become naked and vulnerable to those outside influences. Um, he also uses the amazing phrase, elf all my hair in knots, suggesting that he's going to look wild and almost elf-like by sort of pulling his hair up into knots. So again, he's looking almost animal and also almost magical, almost inhuman. Then when he's pretending to be poor Tom, the bedlam beggar, he says in his pretend madness, this is the foul fiend flibbity gibbet. He begins at curfew and walks till the first cock. So essentially he walks between dusk and dawn. He walks at night. He gives the web and the pin, squints the eye and makes the hair lip mildews the white wheat, and hurts the poor creature of the earth. Aroint thee, witch, aroint thee. 
Now, what's fascinating about this is here, on the one hand, poor Tom seems to be rejecting the idea of witchcraft. He says, aroint thee, witch, aroint thee, which is the same phrase used in Macbeth by a woman who munches chestnuts and refuses to give them to one of the three witches when asked, and so they decide to revenge themselves on her. She says to them, aroint thee. But in seemingly rejecting witches, he's also associating himself with them. He's talking about a fiend or a demon, which, as those of you will know from who've watched video one will know, were associated with witches. He's talking about moving around at night. And he talks about the web and the pin, which sounds awfully like spells, and about how he's acting upon other people's bodies and damaging other people's bodies, and also damaging and interfering with food production in mildewing the white wheat and hurting the poor creatures of the earth. He's saying that the demon does witch-like activities, but he's also associating himself with this demon and with this witch, because he is also someone wandering around on the earth at night. He shares their sort of transgressive and dangerous mobility, and is therefore associating himself in his madness with these darker powers. And that's interesting because I've already talked about in video one about how witches are associated with the weather. And here, poor Tom is suggesting that in being open to the elements, he is also associated with these dangerous ideas that haunt the weather. And when Lear, the fool, and poor Tom are out of doors together, they form a sort of makeshift community that they almost try to make into a home, but it's a tragic parody of the home. It's a sort of almost comic, but at the same time, very poignant version of the home, because they have no shelter. Leah says, make no noise, make no noise, draw the curtains, so, so, we'll go to supper in the morning. So essentially saying they have no food, so they'll have to have their supper in the morning because they can't have it at night. And the fool replies, and I'll go to bed at noon. Here he's suggesting that not just space, but time are topsy-turvy. So he has no place to retire to, he has nowhere to go to bed, he has no bed curtains. And so everything's turned upside down, and the fool might as well suggest that if they're having supper in the morning, they'll go to bed at noon. Space and time associated with the home are both turned upside down, because it's impossible, even in this sort of temporarily hopeful makeshift community, to make a home here without a house. And this experience leads Lear to pity the homeless. It's quite an astonishing moment where a homeless king suddenly finds himself in community with the very poorest and lowest class and most vulnerable people in his kingdom. He says, Poor naked wretches, wheresoe'er you are, that bide the pelting of this pitiless storm, how shall your houseless heads and unfed sides, your looped and windowed raggedness, defend you from seasons such as these? And this is a fascinating image, because on the one hand he's talking about people's heads as houseless, and he's talking about these people as naked, but he's also suggesting that their clothes, which are ragged, in a way attempt to give them a home, because he calls them looped and windowed raggedness, so suggesting that the clothing is like a home that has windows in it, because it has holes in it, so reinforcing the extent to which their lack of clothing and their lack of house makes them vulnerable to the weather, and finding himself in community with them. This is a particularly startling sentiment in early modern England, because in this period, perhaps as you could say, as in ours, there were huge prejudices against the homeless and against beggars. William Harrison, writing in Hollandshed's collection of chronicles, which wrote a history of England and Wales and Scotland, um, writes in a description of England, a section called Of Provision Made for the Poor, and he writes, the punishment that is ordained for this kind of people, so homeless wandering people, is very sharp, and yet it cannot restrain them from their gadding, from their moving around. Wherefore, the end must needs be martial law to be exercised upon them, as upon thieves, robbers, despisers of all laws, and enemies to the commonwealth and welfare of the land. What notable robberies, pilferies, murders, rapes, and stealings of young children, burning, breaking, and disfiguring their limbs to make them pitiful in the sight of the people, I need not rehearse, so I need not tell you, but for their idle roguing about the country, 
the law ordaineth this manner of correction, and the manner of correction is to have them whipped and sent back to their parish of origin. So what Harrison's saying here is that beggars, people who are roaming the countryside begging, are in fact violent criminals. They're thieves, they're robbers, they're murderers, they are rapists. And the suggestion here is that these beggars aren't just violent, they're also fraudulent. So I mentioned earlier that bedlam beggars were often thought to be faking it, in order, faking their madness, just as Edgar does, in order to compel money and pity from people. And Harrison is making a similar complaint here. He's accusing these people of not just being extremely violent, but also burning, breaking and disfiguring their limbs to make them pitiful in the sight of the people. So physically injuring themselves in quite drastic ways in order to be able to compel pity. But what's striking about Harrison's anxieties here are that you may have noticed in the videos in this series so far, a lot of anxiety in this period is attached to the boundaries between the inside and the outside of the home. The idea that outside influences, whether it's the male gaze or witchcraft, are creeping into the home and making it no longer safe, no longer home-like. But in fact, as we saw in the Othello video last week, it's inside the home, in the private spaces of the home, that people could be most vulnerable, especially in the cases of domestic violence, which could even lead to murder. You could argue that here, Harrison is taking anxieties about the vulnerability of people in the home and projecting them onto the homeless and onto beggars as a way of sort of othering that anxiety and making the home itself feel safe. He suggests that people with homes are vulnerable to those without homes. And of course, the truth is that it's those without homes who are most vulnerable in this period. And that's something that Shakespeare's play King Lear beautifully explores in a way that forces us to empathise with the predicament of the unhoused by putting a king in that predicament. It shows us that the homeless are not people to be feared, but rather people who are the least powerful and the most open to the dangers of the natural world and the elements. That's all for today, but next week I'm going to be returning to this idea of the relationship between the outside and the inside, and also returning to some of the interests of my first video, particularly ideas about magic, in talking about the fairies of Midsummer Night's Dream and how they move from the forest to the palace. Thank you very much for watching video number five of Stay at Home Shakespeare, everyone. If you've been watching the series, you may know that I often end with a shout out to a particular theatre or charity. And today I'm going to end with a shout out to Shelter, because it seems very apt considering I've been talking about the plight of the homeless in King Lear. So if you enjoyed this video, you have a spare extra couple of pounds and you would like to, I suggest donating to Shelter or to another homelessness charity. Thank you very much and see you next week.